Good morning, everyone, and welcome to, it's going to be part three now, of examining New Testament passages in an Old Testament context. It's 6.04 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, July 30th, 2018, I'm told. I'm going to bring up the table, and we had left off uh, last time with the quote from Matthew 2.18. Most of these quotes, the early quotes, are coming from Matthew because of what material is being covered in Matthew. We're getting the highest density early on from Matthew. Um, <clears throat> there are going to be some questions, uh, just, you know, some basic rhetorics that I'm going to ask concerning this material as we go. And, yeah, there's definitely a, a marked reason for it, because I think that Although, what we see in a number of these quotes is we, we see a problem in uh, understanding uh, the context, because uh, the context that we're frequently looking back to and examining, uh, it doesn't seem to follow with uh, the context that these passages are in. What does that say exactly? I don't know. I'm not too sure. But um, that's what we're seeing. And I would like to understand what the problem is. If the problem is just me. Or if the problem is perhaps our understanding in general. Um, maybe the um, Maybe the overall ideology, um, the overall understanding that our fathers once had concerning the uh, message, messages, uh, and messengers of Yahweh as represented in the Old Testament. Um, maybe that's just not the understanding that we're seeing reflected in a great portion of what we have in Greek copies of the New Testament. And remember, there are a number of Aramaic copies as well that in a number of ways disagree um, with the Greek, and not in ways that are so... Uh, core or fundamental as to be in, in stark contradiction. But, you know, enough to where I suppose somebody could, uh, thinking about it, say, what else is it that we don't know? Um, does this rabbit hole go deeper? Again, I think there is enough evidence to the contrary uh, even in light of these things that I'm going over, I still think there's plenty of evidence that attests to the Messiahship of Yoshu of Nazareth, the one who himself said that he was uh, the Son of the Living God, the Redeemer, and is shown in his his life, his ministry, death and resurrection. Um, whether you choose to believe it or not, I I can't imagine that many people who don't believe it would be listening to this, but <clears throat> hey, you know, I listen uh, to atheists that talk about a lot of uh, these matters or uh, Bible matters in general because I want to hear uh, both sides and what they have to say. And I've found that, you know, frequently your uh, average Christian wouldn't even want to approach and try to deal with these uh, texts and these matters. So, uh, before I even read, starting at Matthew 3.3, 3, this next quote, I want to, uh, I just want to uh, voice my sincere thanks to uh those individuals 
who have gone out of their way to try to help me as I am really struggling to live right now. Um, and uh, the, the current condition I'm in is definitely... Um, it's 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 going to want to keep me from being able to do work even in the capacity that I've been able to do it unfortunately um so thank you again and thank you everyone who has been uh praying for me and my family i can't say it enough or with enough sincere emotion to illustrate to you how uh, grateful I am. I'm also uh, grateful that two uh, very intelligent men have decided to offer uh, a lot of material um, on both sides of this issue uh, with Anatoly Fomenko and um, his maxima correlation principle and the issue of the timeline in general. Um, and yeah, guys like Scaliger are, are at the heart of that and uh, misconceptions concerning uh, science are also to be blamed. And uh, of course, it, it, it's, it's full spectrum, isn't it? Because it can't just be one individual factor uh, that that anyone would have to distort to change our perceptions of where and when we are. It have to be many things. So we're getting there, and um, more material is going to be presented on that as as time goes and as the Father's willing. So beginning in Matthew three three, this is a as a very well known quote by many, and it's repeated in Mark and Luke and John. In Matthew three three, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, "Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight." Now, I've reviewed the Old Testament passage, and it is the way of Yahweh. Mark 1 3 says the voice of one crying in the Midbar, the wilderness. You don't have to think of deserts, it's the Midbar. It's just the wild. The voice of one crying in the wild. Prepare ye the way of Yahweh. Make his path straight. And that is important because, uh, like I said, all of us have been programmed in one way or another since we we're very young of course, to look at this whole situation and this God as sort of the um, bleak, arid desert God. In fact, I'm told that a number of uh, individuals of other religions call our God, Yahweh, the desert God. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, this is from Luke 3, 4 through 6, Isaiah, or Yeshua the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wild, prepare you the way of Yahweh, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low. The crooked shall be made straight, the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of Elohim. And then in John one twenty three, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wild, make straight the way of Yahweh, as said the prophet Yeshua. Okay. So, we have, um, we have four parallel passages from the four extant canonized Gospels that agree, and their source is universally accepted and also stated in the text as being Yeshua or Isaiah 40, 3 through 5. And I want to make sure that I've also got uh, an Obrey uh, version of that opened. 
I went over this a lot the other day. I, I had begun making a video and um, my son had a lot of trouble sleeping so that video just was not going to happen. So I just I just scrapped it and started again. That's what I normally do. If I can't get through it in one sitting, I even if I have to stop and start a little bit, I just usually scrap it. <clears throat> so uh, again, right? We always want to look at it in context. Um, I'm in Brenton's. I can stay in Brenton's. I just want you to know. Um, that I'm in the, the Septuagint. Okay, so the thing is, if you go to the chapter before, it is right after the king, Hezekiah, is recovered from an illness that he had and told by Yeshua the prophet that he would be given uh, another 15 years. And he had these envoys come from Babel, or Babylon, and he decided to show them all of the riches and wealth and power and strength that uh, the kingdom of Judah had to offer. <laughs> and that one always vexed me. Why on earth, you know, what you're just showing off? I, it just, I thought to myself, this guy, what is he doing? I mean, is, is he boasting? You know, right after... I, I, I would just imagine after my life would be miraculously saved by the living God, Yahweh, I just couldn't see myself. I, you know, maybe he was just, everybody's experienced that, you know, where they're, uh, where they're kind of on a high and they're, so they're not thinking straight or right. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah, he shows them all the wealth of, of Judah. And, I mean, um, if you're looking at another kingdom that might have some strength and, and might really want to acquire such wealth, it <laughs> seems to me like you're just inviting trouble. Anyway, so, you know, Yeshua asked him, what did you do? What did you show them? And he told them. <laughs> and... Uh, Starting in Isaiah uh, 39.5, it says, uh, And Isaiah said to him, Hear the word of Yahweh Tzabaeth, or of hosts. Um, Tzabaeth is like hordes or armies. And it's first used in, I believe it's Genesis 2, the first verse. All the hordes um, of the Shemaim and Aretz. Uh, anyways, so Isaiah 39, 6, Behold, the days come when they shall take all the things that are in your house and all that your fathers have gathered until this day shall go to Babel, and they shall not leave anything at all. And Aliyim hath said, that they shall take also of thy children whom you shall beget, and they shall make them eunuchs in the house of the king of. It says the Babylonians, so I have to look at the underlying text and see if that's actually the Kashdim. Because uh, those people that had their capital at Babel were called the Kashdim. So it goes on, and... Um, and Ezekias, Hezekiah, said to Esias, Isaiah, Good is the word of Yahweh which he has spoken. Let there, I pray, be peace and righteousness in my days. Well, there's a guy who's definitely forward thinking, concerned about his children and grandchildren. Uh, <laughs> gets me. So then it goes on. Um, Remember, these chapter and verse stops were not put in by the authors, so somebody put this in afterwards. But sometimes the authors, they do stop a, a thought and, you know, start up something else. So you show you 40 and 1. Uh, comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith Alim. Speak ye priests to the heart of Jerusalem. Comfort her, for her humiliation is accomplished. Her sin is put away, for she has received of Yahweh's hand, double the amount of her sins. The voice 
of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of Yahweh, make straight the paths of our Alayim. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and all the crooked ways shall become straight, and the rough places plains. And the glory of Yahweh shall appear, and all flesh shall see the salvation of Alayim, for Yahweh has spoken it. Now it continues, the voice of one saying, Cry. And I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Alayim abides for ever. And um, uh, there's quite a lot of prophetic poetry after this from 40 and verse 9 all the way out to 40 and verse 31 um, of course one of the verses in here is um, <clears throat> is used a lot in the arguments between uh, flat earthers and sphere earthers right Isaiah 40 22 it's he that comprehend now this is in Brent Septuagint this translation it's he that comprehends the circle of the earth and the inhabitants in it are as grasshoppers. He has set up the heaven as a chamber and stretched it out as a tent to dwell in. That's very interesting. Anyways, and then one of my favorites is the, the final verse. Uh, they that wait on Alayim shall renew their strength. They shall put forth new feathers like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not hunger. KJV says faint. Now I'm going to the KJV version. Uh, so the, you can see such similarities. And they are. Between KJV and Brenton's. Isaiah 40 and 3. The voice of him that cries in the wilderness. Prepare you the way of Yahweh. Make his straight in the... And um, this is Oribe. All right, not desert. Uh, there's actually no, uh, there's no one that could prove that Oribe should be um, translated as desert. Make straight in the Oribe or plains a highway for our Alayim. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. The crooked shall be made straight. The rough places plain. And the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken it. So, contextually, no one, I don't think, could really make a case to uh, the one way or to the other way. I don't believe so. Um, and I think what we're seeing here and I've read it through in the Obri. The only thing I, I say is odd is the fact that um, Yeshua 43 in the Obri starts out Kul Kura instead of Kra, which would be more appropriate as in um, to call. Um... The idea of crying, I know that in modern English we think of crying as weeping. Um, cool sound, and then uh, the QRA would be a call. And this actually has an extra U, so-called vav, an extra U, uh, between the, uh, the Q and the R. And that only happens uh, a couple of times with all of the occurrences of QRA, Kura, as call. And that can't be an accident. <clears throat> like as uh, some people say, uh, the Isaiah scroll, right? From the Dead Sea Scrolls. A lot of people use that to try to show that a number of the textual um, particularities specifically in Isaiah are just either uh, scribal missteps you know or that they don't matter and um, I disagree I think every character 
that is used and the way that it is used matters. Whether we do or do not understand why it would be there and what it is doing specifically to the word there, it matters. So, it says in Midbar, and as I said, the Midbar should in no way be uh, construed as deserts, neither should Oribe. One reason, um, another name for evening is Orab. Um, Orab is it's used for a number of things. You'll find Oreb and Oribe all over the place when Yishrael is actually uh, in the area of Moab. Uh, before they are entering into the land of promise over Eh Yarden. And as I said, there is no, there's no other uh, parallel word as many different uses as Orbe has to indicate that it would be desert. So again, I would say, um, the plains. Um, there is another word that I believe is very good for meadows. Um, and in fact, very frequently, the King James translators and many, many, many others will take this word orbe and they will translate it as plain. But here they decided that John the Baptist and forward thinking, I suppose, to Yeshua, because remember, these translations are coming from people who have hit both Old and New Testament. So, they could go back and forth making the translations fit as they wished. But in many other places, Oreb, Orebe is translated as a plain. And a plain is not a desert. A desert is something specific. A plain. What is a plain? Well, you know, in America, we have a few states like um, South Dakota, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, that are called the Great Plain states. Because there are, in fact, they are loaded with great plains, and I have driven through a number of them, and they are great plains. You know what a plain is. And consider the fact that Oreb is also the word used for evening. And Boker, the word commonly used for cattle, is also used as morning. It's in Genesis 1, Boker and Oreb. Now, so, it's so interesting, the next word is this masle. The reason I find it interesting is the context that masle is used in. And the root mas and what you can find root-wise for le. Uh, oftentimes, it is translated as um, highway. Um, and I think it's interesting because I think we should actually view it as uh, a highway. Uh, not just a, a path, let's just say, not just a path that many people have used. And so it could be designated as, you know, a highway. But a great broad road built for and maintained specifically by the Melech, or king, or Peroa, or whomever the leader is, because they call them different things in different places. Um, remember Shechem, his father was Hamur. It's very interesting how these different leaders, the name of their status or station is similar to or equivalent to names of various animals. Anyways, I'll continue with this. Uh, <clears throat> so I would say this, this mass lays, I think it's very appropriate to look at it as a specifically built, leveled, even highway for travel. 
Is it like the highways we have today with blacktop and, you know, um, I'm not saying that. But whatever materials they used and engineering they used, this, I believe, would be like a dedicated highway in the plain, a highway to Alainu, our Alaim. And then the Obri in 40 and 4, it reflects, it reflects pretty well um, what we're seeing from the English translations. I don't think it's necessarily saying the things that we see translated into English in exactly the way that we see them being said. Um, but I think that we're looking at the right idea. You know, um, a sort of evenness that works. Um, so at this point in time, even though a lot could be said about the translations of the prophets, and I'm sure I will have a lot to say about that as time goes on. Um, all in all, um, I don't know that one can say one way or another whether that is uh, appropriately applied or not. Perhaps it is. But I don't see a, a contextual problem. Uh, I don't know that I see anyone pulling that, per se, from context. Not in the ways uh, I've seen some of the passages up till now. The next is Matthew 4.4. 4, and... Then four six and four seven. Um, these are basically um, when there is this scene being played out of um, Yusho in the mid bar, and he is uh, he's been fasting for forty days, and he is quite thirsty. And it says that, well, let's go to Matthew 4. Okay. Yeah, it says he's led in the spirit <clears throat> into the wilderness. To be tempted of the devil, Diablos. You know that uh, Satan's also used in the New Testament. And you know that um, Shaitan in the Old Testament, it doesn't even show up until, I think it's Numbers 22. And it doesn't have the context you would think of as like the great Satan, you know, all red with horns and a bifurcated tail, toting a pitchfork. It, it's not like that. It, uh, it means to adversary, Shaitan. <laughs> Um, so in here, yeah, the Greek would be rendering it Diablos. So there's this scene between this, uh, Diablos and you show in the Midbar. And, uh, Diablos is questioning him and tempting him. <clears throat> right? He, it even says right here, Matthew 4, 3, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every matter, it says in here, word, crema, that proceeds from the mouth of, of God. Um, you'll find that from Deuteronomy. 
And I think that's interesting. Deuteronomy 8.3. Just going to take a look at it real fast. Because TSK is really interesting. Hopefully I can apply something here. So we're at Deuteronomy 8.3. All right, but by every, by all, there's no, it doesn't say word that precedes. All right, by all. And then it's mutsa, by all that goes forth from the mouth. And you see in the text, it's actually Yahweh. I don't know why that matters. Well, there's a reason, and I've illustrated this in the past. <clears throat> Tempt her and come to him, if you be the Son of God. Everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God, Theos. The problem is, you're going to see as we go, that, um, that Theos... It's used for both Yahweh and Alayim. Those are different. Alayim is title. Yahweh is name. It is a descriptive name, nonetheless. But you will find, as you track through New Testament quotes of Old Testament passages, the authors, if they really had written this in Greek, why would they not distinguish between Yahweh and Alayim? Oh yes, Yahweh is Alayim. However, there is enough of a distinction that I would think the New Testament writers would make that distinction. That is why I think that the New Testament was not written in Greek. Not the original autographs. So, I did think one was really interesting, though. Matthew 4, 7. This is when uh, Diablos is uh, to have taken him uh, up to the... It says he took him up to the holy city and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning you. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. Diablos said, It is written about you. They'll actually... Um, give this um, and I can jump back to it real quick so it's Matthew 4 7 because TSK isn't giving me it not quickly enough uh no now here we go Psalm 90 this is an important Psalm actually because it's saying that Diablos is saying to him Pay attention that it's written of you. Okay? I'm just going to read this. Um, I'll read it in KJV. Well, uh, I'll probably change the these and thous a little bit, but you'll get the idea. And I want you to uh I want you to listen to it <clears throat> and consider um, what it is that the the psalmist is saying. I had to truncate that real quick. Because I found out that I was reading the wrong psalm. So I had actually gone into that and read up to that point and realized that I was reading the wrong psalm. I apologize. It's actually in the KJV, it's 91, and it's 90 in Brenton Septuagint. I was wondering about that because I'd gone over that psalm just the other day, and I thought, that's not making any sense. Okay. So just consider who the psalmist is speaking to. I'll read it from the... KJV, uh, which is based on, uh, I guess, the Masoretic, which would be Leningrad. But uh, Psalm 91.1, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow 
of the Almighty. I will say of Yahweh, he's my refuge and my fortress, my Elohim, and him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shall you trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made Yahweh, which is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, and keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under foot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he's known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. So in that account... Diablo said is it is written about you and then we go back here to Psalm 91 11 and 12 in the Masoretic KJV and in Brenton's it would be 90 11 and 12 it better be I'm on 90 and I'm in Brenton oh now I'm just ticked Hang on, it's 91, 11 and 12 in Brenton. Sorry, didn't change over fast enough. Same thing. He'll give his angels charge concerning you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. If you take that out of context, it could be referring to anyone. All I'm asking is, in context, is that something that seems clear to me and I hate to say it it's not as clear <sighs> there's a guy that wrote a book um, that uh, somebody in a Bible study that I used to attend a long time ago um, <clears throat> he used to use it <sighs> as part of this series that he was doing in this uh, Bible study cell group <laughs> cell group it was called Jesus on every page and you guys can't understand the reservations I have about minimizing um, the messiahship of you show I really do but I'm just trying to be uh, entirely honest and tell you that there are certain things I'm not seeing and I never have. I've never understood a lot of these contextual problems, especially when people who are, let's say, they're debating specific doctrines, let's say from the New Testament, and they use these specific passages. And I know that contextually, they're at least confusing to me and these folks when they they debate these these topics they're not slow to call those who disagree with their assessment or of, of facts heretics they're not slow or timid about doing that and you know if they're going to base a lot of the weight of their argument 
on passages which I think they're difficult to understand when you put them back in their context. How can they run around calling other people heretics? I listened for a long time when I was gradually um, disbecoming <laughs> uh, a Trinitarian. I listened to a lot of debates between uh, Trinitarians and Unitarians. There's a lot of different kinds of Unitarians, by the way. And uh, so they're not all created equal. They all have very different beliefs, too. But um, it was amazing to me that most of the Trinitarians, this is funny, how far back it goes with the Trinitarians being so vicious in their attacks towards non-Trinitarians, verbally vicious. I've heard more uh, from the Trinitarian camp towards the non-Trinitarian camp. We'll say non-Trinitarians because there could be a lot of things that are non-Trinitarian. You could be Unitarian. You could be Binitarian. You know? You could be uh, modalist. I mean, you know, there are a number of people in CI that uh, believe that uh, Yusho is Yahweh in the flesh, the very one and only, the one and the same. The great Elohim, Yahweh, um, in a a bodily form, period. So, not all non-Trinitarians are the same whatsoever. But it's surprising to me that a number of these passages that I, I think are not as clear as maybe other people think they are, they're used all the time by Trinitarians. The same kind of people that are so quick to call others heretics. I don't like that word. Uh, that word heretic is usually preceded by some bad things going down towards those people that were called heretics, you know? Hey, folks, my son is up, so I'm going to wrap this up. But um, I am going to pick up uh, next time with the quote where he is in the synagogue in Egalil. And it's very interesting when we go back to the source text and what we see there. I'm going to leave you hanging on that because it's very telling concerning the other things we've been talking about and some other good news i have actually gotten to the point where i have figured out the size of abram's entourage as early as genesis 14 and the sheer amount of animal product they would need i have gone to great lengths to actually find out everything concerning these various different animals and what product they can produce and how well they can sustain people and how many they can sustain and for how long and their pasture land tables and how much they would need and all kinds of things about the land which so from here on out the only thing that needs to be done is extrapolation forward and when you consider that we will be extrapolating forward, and when all things are said and done by 400 years, things should get pretty interesting about the time of the Exodus. So I am really hopeful that all of you are well taken care of by the Father and that you will take care of others. Farewell.